What's up, Internet? Welcome to Once Over. I'm Kaylee, and today we're going to be giving the Once Over to Butcher Baker Nightmare Maker. You think you got it all figured out, don't you? Well, you're wrong! There will be spoilers. Released in 1981, Butcher Baker Nightmare Maker is possibly the most poorly marketed slasher film of the 80s. On the surface, it's a tale of an obsessive aunt trying to control her nephew, but if you look just a little bit deeper, you'll find that it's a complex Oedipus story with deep commentary about sexuality. In 1983, it was rebranded as Nightwatch, and let me tell you, neither title and neither marketing campaign even gives you the slightest idea of what this movie is about. Just take a look at this trailer. Night warning. Billy and Julie, young, innocent, in love. By accident, they've stumbled onto a grisly murder. Now, they know too much to live. A chilling tale of a young boy and girl, innocent victims. Now, targets of a frenzied obsession with murder. Um, yeah. Now let me tell you the actual plot of the movie. The film starts out with Billy's parents getting into a horrible car crash, resulting in him being an orphan. This car crash is the clear inspiration for the similar scene in Final Destination 2, and let me tell you, both movie moments send chills up my spine. But luckily, or unluckily, after the car crash, Billy's Aunt Cheryl takes him in. And right from the get-go, we can tell that this is going to be a crazy Oedipus tale where Cheryl is into Billy in all of the incestual ways. She purrs in his ear and has a clear affection for her adopted son. Wake up, sweetie. Threatened by the possibility that Billy is going to leave her for a basketball scholarship and for his girlfriend Julia, Cheryl hatches a plan to keep him around because she has weird attachment issues. Whatever makes you happy. I'll see you tonight. You make me happy. She figures that if she can convince Billy that she's in danger, that he'll stick around so that he can protect her. She goes about this by sexually assaulting the TV repairman and then claiming that he raped her. Subsequently, she murders him. Genius. Besides this murder, which happens around 17 minutes into the film and the car crash in the beginning, we won't see another on-screen death until the last 20 minutes of the film, which means that there are 50 solid minutes of no deaths in a slasher film. Typically, that would result in a pretty dull horror movie, but Cheryl's descent into insanity moves the pacing and keeps the viewer engaged throughout. Detective Joe Carlson investigates the rape and murder, and he discovers that the TV repairman is actually gay and in a relationship with Billy's basketball coach. The lovely detective, who is a homophobic asshole, concludes that the TV repairman couldn't have possibly raped Cheryl because she is a woman and he likes men. Detective Asshole becomes convinced that there's a love triangle going on between Billy, the TV repairman, and the coach. And further, that Billy is to blame for the murder. I promise that we're going to deep dive into the portrayal of gay characters within this film, but first let's continue on with the plot. Cheryl, still obsessed with keeping Billy around, starts poisoning his milk. Keeping in mind that this is an Oedipus story, we could say that the milk of his aunt's figurative teat is causing him to perform poorly, or rendering him impotent. Billy becomes suspicious of Aunt Cheryl, so he asks his girlfriend Julia to distract her while he snoops around. Specifically, he wants to get inside her box. He discovers that she isn't actually Aunt Cheryl, but in fact, she's Mom Cheryl. She gave birth to Billy, didn't want him, gave him to her sister, then decided that she wanted him again, so she cut the brake lines to his parents' car so that they would die, which resulted in the car crash from the beginning of the film. Cheryl proceeds to go on a violent rampage. She kills the neighbor, kills a police sergeant, tries to kill Julia, and says, I'm your girlfriend. <laughs> while trying to subdue Billy, who manages to stab her in self-defense. After narrowly escaping, Billy calls the coach for help because obviously he can't call the cops since the cops think that he's behind everything. But like all killers in slasher films, and also like all overbearing mothers, Cheryl just won't go away. She pops back to life and Billy stabs her with a fire poker. I love phallic imagery. Detective Joe shows up shortly after the coach and insists that Cheryl can't be to blame for all the murders because, you know, he's an asshole. No need to fret though because we soon get to experience true vindication when this subplot villain gets shot by Billy. 
I honestly think that it would have been a little bit sweeter if the coach had shot him. The idea of a gay man offing a homophobe gives me the warm, fuzzy justice feels. In any case, Cheryl is dead, douchebag detective is dead, and Billy and Julia move on with their lives as described in this Lifetime movie-esque scroll. And the coach? Well, I have no idea what happens to the coach, which honestly kind of irks me. Let's get into it now. There are always gray areas with everything, including if homosexual subtext is sensationalized or not. And for me and Butcher Baker Nightmare Maker, not only do I think that the portrayal of gay characters was thoughtful and fairly normalized, I think it was actually pretty progressive, especially for the time. Firstly, we have the coach, who is just gay. There's no major discussion about it, it's just his sexuality. His character isn't sensationalized, and it comes off as a genuine portrayal. He's dating a TV repairman, a homosexual man with a blue-collar job, which is the anti-stereotype, especially in the 80s when gay men were expected to be elite, polished, and effeminate. Neither man was ever treated like the laughingstock of a joke. Something that I particularly liked about the coach is that he takes the time to tell Detective Asshole that his boyfriend actually used to be married to a woman, adding a layer of bisexuality into the mix. If it weren't for this brief moment, I would have felt like the film was too black and white when it came to discussions about sexuality and the idea that a gay man could never rape a woman. Adding this bit of backstory brings fluidity to the entire plot. On the topic of sexuality, Billy's sexuality is questioned throughout the entire film. And more astonishingly, we don't actually ever find out what his sexuality is. I can't say enough about how much I love that we never find out, because really, it doesn't matter. Now, I can't talk about the sexuality aspect of this film without talking about the quintessential homoerotic 1980s slasher Nightmare on Elm Street 2, which came out four years after Butcher Baker Nightmare Maker. Nightmare on Elm Street 2 famously flipped the script by having a final boy instead of having a final girl, something that was probably in inspired by Butcher Baker, given that Billy is the clear final boy of the movie. Nightmare on Elm Street 2 is often referred to as the gayest horror movie ever made. Mark Patton plays Jesse Walsh, and there is a homoerotic undercurrent coursing through the veins of the film. At the time of filming and its release, Patton was a closeted gay man who was terrified of being typecast as one. His fears came true, and at a time when homophobia was skyrocketing, Patton didn't work in the film industry again until 2013. Now openly gay, Patton's story can be seen in the documentary Scream Queen, My Nightmare on Elm Street, which I highly recommend that you check out if you haven't already seen it. Unlike Patton, Jimmy McNichol, who played Billy and Butcher Baker, was not mocked into submission for his role. I don't know that I have a really good answer for why the two had such different experiences, but what I can say is that I think that Butcher Baker is iconic because of it. Fun fact, Steve Easton, who plays the coach in Butcher Baker, also has a small role in Nightmare on Elm Street 2. Seeing how Butcher Baker transcends the homophobia in Nightmare on Elm Street 2, and also the transphobia in films like Sleepaway Camp, which is a movie that we will discuss on another day, frames 80s horror films in a new light. I'm thankful for this breath of fresh air when it comes to slasher films. Do you feel like this movie was progressive, or do you think that it was a little bit cliched when it comes to the portrayal of sexuality? Butcher Baker has atypical gender norms, starting with Billy as the final girl, but moreover with female villain Cheryl, played by the late great Susan Tyrell. I love me an evil woman, and Susan Tyrell might be the worst, or the best. I think the New York Times said it best in her obituary. She was a whiskey-voiced character actress with a talent for playing the downtrodden, auteur, and grotesque. I certainly wouldn't want to be a slab of beef around Tyrell. It would have been easy and sadly acceptable to have one of the homosexual characters be the killer in this film, but instead of taking that problematic path, it doesn't characterize gayness as being deranged, and rather chooses to have homophobic Cheryl be the truly demented one. Although there are some discriminatory moments in the film, I think that it overall looks at sexuality and gender in a really positive way. That wrapped in with Cheryl's descent into madness, quick pacing, and a thoughtful script make me love this movie. As slasher films go, I would easily rate this 6 out of 7 thumbs up. It rates really high up there in my favorite slasher films of the 80s. What did you think about this movie? Let me know in the comments down below. I would love to hear if you thought that it was progressive or problematic. Thank you so much for watching. If you haven't already, please subscribe. And of course, I can't wait for the next one.